So good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you to the organizers for, for having me here. It's a great honor to speak to you on this special occasion. And it's always a great pleasure to be in Maastricht, to, to see this whole place growing over the last 14 years since Rainer moved here and built up this group. And every time I came here, which was usually several times a year, something new had developed, and uh, it was just amazing. So um, me coming more from a neuroanatomical background, uh, I'm, of course, also interested in the human brain. But uh, of course, there are some Diff maybe some different ideas I have about connectivity than, 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 than you might have it when you, when you come from the uh, human connectome side, from diffusion imaging. And I just want to give you a brief insight in some work we have been doing over the years and then also some work we have been doing together with the Maastricht group here to further um, improve the uh, research on, on brain connectivity. So when you Set back a little bit and think about what is what is your what is the important question about brain connectivity? Then, of course, the first thing which comes to your mind is uh, it's a question of which regions are connected to each other, and uh, but also you you quickly come to the point that you want to know what is the direction of these connections, and how dense are the connections, and what is the convergence divergence of this connectivity, and. Soon, sooner or later, you come to a point where you're not only interested in what goes on in the, in the white matter, but you, you also have to learn what goes on in the, in the gray matter. So you have to learn uh, what is the laminar origin of the connections, because that's some very important information we need to, for example, classify hierarchies in these connectivity schemes. Uh, what is the termination pattern? Same. And even what is the postsynaptic target? And I think when you, when you look at, at schemes like this, you see, well, there is, there is a lot of connectivity and we probably know a lot about which area is connected to which one. But then when you, when you look at that uh, on the level of, and I skip that, on the level of individual axons, you, you, you see that it's, that it's not that straightforward. I mean, this is, for example, an, an axon of a feedback system going from, from higher motion detection area in the cat visual system back to primary cat visual cortex. And as you see, only this part of the axon from here to here is in the white matter. This is what happens in the gray matter. And you see in the gray matter, there is, there is a lot of, of important branchings and, and contacts which actually in the end, really classify the functionality of this connectivity. Uh, and in the end, you even want to learn more about this. So these are different axons we, we reconstructed here and also try to identify postsynaptic targets and try to identify contacts with them because that's, in the end, what, what, what gives you the functional or the basis for any functional interaction. So um, how can we get to that? I mean, this is all animal experiments, also in the human. Of course, one way of doing that is diffusion MR, for example. But uh, being a bit more old-fashioned, you can also do post-mortem tracing, for example, using fluorescent dyes. I mean, these are simply lipophilic dyes which diffuse into membranes. And as neurons have the longest membranes in the brain, uh, you can also nicely stain axons by a simple passive diffusion technique going anterogradely to the terminations and going backwards to the parent cell bodies. And um, I will exemplify what we did on, on that side, uh, showing you a bit about connectivity in the human temporal cortex. And as I told you, indeed, you can nicely show axonal structures. These are intrinsic axons uh, within area 22, so it's her tertiary language cortex. So you see the axons uh, converging onto a certain patch of, of, of terminations, and you can also see some basal dendrites of reciprocally connected cells, which by themselves again project to the, uh, to the injection site. And when we uh, first started out, we of course first looked at intracortical connectivity, which was already quite something. Because also intracortical connectivity is a long-range connectivity type. I mean, it goes over several millimeters and is not a random uh, connectivity. But when you look at that in the tangential plane, what you can see is that, uh, so for example, here the dye injection was about, about here. I only took a small part of the picture. What you can see is that there is a topographically specific pattern of connection. So uh, this, this pot we injected here, 
uh, is only selectively connected on the long range level for a few millimeters to certain other spots within the same cortical area. And of course, as I told you, we are working on a language area. There was, of course, an important question, is this connectivity maybe different between the left and the right hemisphere? And as you may already guess from this picture showing the reconstruction of the results from two injections, uh, from the right and from the left, uh, the spacing or the distance between these interconnected cortical modules is different. And we could also quantify that, that consequently in the left hemisphere, uh, these, these modules tended to be further apart from each other than in the right hemisphere. Uh, even though the modules themselves were not very different in size, pointing towards a different architecture of selectively interconnected cortical columns. And now, <clears throat> We know from the visual system that we can link these intrinsic patterns, these intrinsically connected uh, modules also to the functional architecture of cortex. So this is an, an image I get from a colleague, uh, Kerstin Schmidt and Sigrid Löwe, uh, which overlays the functional architecture of visual cortex with the anatomical architecture of the connectivity. So the black dots simply represent orientation domains within the cortex for uh, horizontal orientations. And what Kerstin did was she injected a green dye and a red dye in these two locations, which both were located in horizontal orientation domains. And then she plotted the uh, different uh, retrograde labeled cell bodies here. And um, what you can see is most of them are concentrated uh, in orientation domains, in orientation columns, which have the same preference. So, in a way, these intrinsically <coughs> connected modules also represent intrinsically connected functional units. And so, in the end, what we can learn from this, um, from this connectivity patterns, even though in language cortex we don't know what these modules are good for. In visual cortex we know with orientation detectors, for example, but here we don't yet know that. But we can at least give also indications that these modules exist also in higher cortical areas, can give you some idea of the dimensions of these modules, and then uh, use this, and that's where, where uh, for example, your wonderful center now comes in. Now with high field techniques, you can try to resolve these also on a functional level. And so we can bring together connectivity data from intercortical connections and functional architecture to learn more about the processing arch architecture and see how this is, this is uh, really working in, in action in real life. And of course, the second part of connectivity we are interested in is also inter-aerial connectivity. And also this can be tackled by these post-mortem techniques, at least for short range connections of a few centimeters. As I told you, it's a diffusion process, so if you want to get a labeling of like two centimeters connections, you need to wait for a year or so. So it's, it's, it's not fast research. But um, also here, uh, we try to, to, to analyze and reconstruct the hierarchy of connectivity in the human temporal cortex with respect also to maybe language systems, and looked at these different areas. We probably know from the Brodmann classification, uh, but for practical reasons, we were all also focusing on the economy classification. But uh, be that as it may, I mean, this corresponds to area 41 primary auditory cortex, and we have the so-called belt region with a secondary area 42 or TB in the economo, and then we have the area 22 with its an anterior and posterior portion. Uh, which were TA2 and TA1, respectively, in the economic classification. And by injecting these dyes, for example, here, uh, sorry, here, um, we could also nicely label uh, long-range connectivity going to the outer part of the, of, the, um, of the first temporal gyrus and interconnecting different locations in different cortical regions with each other. Uh, I won't bore you with all the details. I was just show you maybe a little bit of, of how we uh, have to work there. I mean, we have to then look at the slices and, and look at individual axons, reconstruct individual axons and cell bodies and try to map them with their cortical location. And eventually, we can come up also with a connectivity scheme, which nicely shows a hierarchy of connectivity uh, very much similar to the... Uh, I think I do it that way very much similar to what we know from the visual system, that we have here the core region, 
uh, which we uh, actually, in terms of connectivity, could even split up in two different primary-like areas, which then both projected differently into the higher areas so that we have a, uh, from the core region, from the primary cortex uh, connectivity stream to the, to the anterior part of the belt region and then to the tertiary areas and then another posterior stream which may form also the anatomical basis for, uh, for different processing streams in the temporal cortex for auditory information. And, of course, it would be nice now to, to get a fuller view, more connectivity, which, of course, now we are limited with this method, and so we should try to combine that to, to more large-scale methods such as diffusion imaging. And we try to do that, uh, which started out in uh, Camille Ugerbild's lab in Minnesota with Deshi Kim and uh, Ita Maronen, and then we continued it here with Ala Dröbruck and uh, um, Matteo Bastiani and uh, Arne Seehaus. So we first did our post-mortem tracing in a full temporal or good portion of the temporal cortex lobe. And then we, uh, oops, um, we put it in the scanner, did a high <coughs> resolution, 9.4 uh, Tesla scanner and did a high resolution diffusion scan and then analyzed the anatomical picture in relation to the, um, to the functional picture, uh, to, the, to the MR picture. And as you can already guess here, um, I try to, to, to find similar slices here. The general direction of the connectivity is very similar, and also the, the little, uh, uh, <clears throat> the little uh, passes coming from the, from the main pass going from here to, to there look, look already very similar. And we tried to quantify that together with Arne, who first started with me in Darmstadt and then uh, switched to Maastricht to continue his work with Rainer and Allard. And so we tried to find sim simply classify uh, in how far can we really, with tractography, reconstruct the correct path? And therefore, we simply uh, took white matter voxel, which contained also, after overlaying anatomical maps and uh, functional uh, and, and, and M M M uh, diffusion maps, uh, which would contain actually labeled, uh, anatomically labeled uh, uh, um, axons, and those which definitely did not. And uh, so these were called the false voxels, these were called the, uh, <clears throat> the true voxels. And then we would do a um, tractography from these voxels and see if they were able to hit our injection site. So that this would be, if, if a true voxel would really give us a, a, sorry, a pass to the, um, uh, to the injection site, this would be a hit. And if it wouldn't, it would be a miss. And then on the other hand, if, it, if a not involved voxel would uh, not project to the injection site in the tractography, this would be a, a correct rejection. While if it still would do it, it would be a, a false alarm. And so we could calculate sensitivity and specificity here for this and use that to, to quantify uh, what we see with these sensitivity and, and uh, specificity at different FA values. And what you can see here from, from, from the overall average is that at FA values of 0 .8, uh, 0 0.08 to 0 0.1, we have the best uh, compromise, the best ratio between sensitivity and specificity. And of course, that depends a, bit, a little bit on the distance of the tracts we, we reconstructed. So for short tracts, it was, it was very, very nice, but if you take longer tracks, it's, it's a bit worse. Be that as it may, uh, we were able to, to, to show that, that uh, with diffusion MR, we can, <coughs> even on the, when we take individual axons as markers, we could, we could nicely reconstruct pathways. And um, as a second approach, we also try to quantify tractography or uh, diffusion MR uh, on the basis of, of, of simply axon trajectories we could see anatomically with myelin stains as in the white matter as well as in the gray matter. And um, then would, would calculate uh, tensors, either diffusion tensors for the MR data and uh, structure tensors for the anatomical data based on the myelin stains and overlay them as you can see in this, uh, these insets here for different regions of um, of, this, uh, of, of the tissue. And um, 
So these, 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 these structure tensors, we would, uh, of course, we have to, 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 to resample somehow because our anatomical pixel are much smaller than the, than the voxel we had for the MR, so we would calculate uh, uh, eventually a tensor which could contain different directions and overlay this with the, with the MR tensor. And here you can see the resulting maps for an example slice, and you can already guess that for many regions there is a very good um, uh, uh, <coughs> a, a, a very good agreement between the two techniques, between the histology and the myelin stain and between the, um, between the diffusion tensors. So when you look at the angular differences between the uh, diffusion tensors and the structural tensors, you see that most, most of them are really in the range of zero, even though of course, in white matter, the error is much less. So this is the, uh, uh, just a grayscale coded map of the, of the uh, angular difference here. And you see that in the, in, the, in the white matter, of course, it's, it's much easier because there is much more order in the fibers, while in the, in the gray matter, it tends to be a bit more difficult. And you can also oops, see that when you look at, at the different insets here in this figure, that uh, A, which is, um, which, is, which is a field in the, uh, in the gray matter, you, you tend to have a lot of, especially in, in the upper layers, you, you, you have a tendency for, for having more errors than uh, you have it for, for example, here in the, in, the, in the white matter where you have a strong track which is, which is going through. But nevertheless, we were principally able also for the, white, for the gray matter to resolve the different uh, horizontal stripes of axons faithfully, even though the fiber density and directionality is much less. Um, and also see the incoming uh, fibers. You could see also here when you when you look at the directly at the myelin stain, this horizontally, uh, uh, this is vertically traversing uh, axon bundles we see in the cortex. So overall, we we uh, could show that that diffusion MR techniques are a very very promising tool, especially at high field strengths for reconstructing also the finer structure of connectivity and giving us new perspective to study the human connectome. And so I think I've already filled my time, so I will just mention my co-workers and thank them from the Darmstadt group. This is Oriana, Andreas, and Arne, who is kind of between Maastricht and, and, uh, and Darmstadt, who did the anatomical work, and then the Maastricht group, Allard, Matteo, and Rainer, and of course, Itamar Ronen and Deshi Kim, with whom we started together with Camille Ugobil, the whole uh, histological validation of diffusion MR. Well, thank you for your attention.